Hi, AP European History Kids. I miss you. My crazy seventh period. Um, <clears throat> so this is going to be a super long presentation. <laughs> I apologize for that in advance. But basically it's kind of spanning all of Unit 1. So I went ahead and already assigned uh, the assignments on Google Classroom via um, Albert I.O. Um, and it is uh, long essay responses as well as short answer responses. And I kind of told you the reason for that um, in the other video. It's basically because your AP exam is more than likely going to be um, writing based. Or it, I mean it is writing based, but I don't know whether or not it's going to be a long essay question or a short essay question. So all your assignments are going to be focused solely around the writing component or the writing aspects. Um, <clears throat> unit 1 in terms of AP Euro does cover some other topics, but I went ahead and looked at the topics that I feel are a little bit more confusing and more detailed. Um, the Renaissance is also part of Unit 1, but in terms of class-wise, I felt like you guys got that really early on. Um, the reason why I'm focusing on these two specific topics and the Albert I.O. questions focus on these two topics are because I feel like these two topics are going to carry over across the other units also. A lot of the things that happen for the Protestant Reformation and uh, in terms of absolutism are going to carry over into other ideas, other concept, uh, concepts that we're going to see across other units. Um, <clears throat> and they really set the stage for a lot of the things that happen in European history that shaped the way European history developed over time. And so um, while I feel like the Renaissance is a very important part or a very important aspect, you guys pretty much got the gist of it. It had a lot to do with art um, and much more about um, people being able to express themselves. We talked about famous artists, um, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, uh, Raphael. I showed you pictures, I showed you paintings, and I feel like if they were to ask you a question about something like that, you could do pretty well on your own. If they were to ask you a question about this, you would need a lot more background and referencing to be able to answer something fully and elaborately. Um, in a more complex setting. Uh, and especially when you're trying to get those uh, higher points, those complexity points, when they really ask you on how to, uh, how they connect across different time periods. So what we're gonna go through today, and I'm gonna try and do it fast, I'm gonna try. You guys know I love to talk about this stuff. So um, I'm gonna try and go through as fast as I can. Um, it's gonna be about the Protestant Reformation, so the context behind that. Um, the shifts in monarchy, so it has a lot to do with the line of succession. The Counter-Reformation, which is the Church's response to the Protestant Reformation, as well as um, absolutism and the belief kind of like a um, divine right of kings, if you will. Uh, so the definition and the beliefs behind that, as well as several monarchs who are practicers and believers of um, absolute, absolutism. Okay, so <clears throat> the background has a lot to do with the War of the Roses um, in England. So we have to figure out why these two families were at war, how eventually we're going to get to Henry VIII, who is going to be the monarch that completely changes um, the church in England. And so in order to understand that, we have to understand that for generations, these families or these two families in England were fighting with each other for legitimate claims to the English throne. So you have the Yorks that are represented by the White Rose and the Lancasters that are represented by the Red Rose. So why did the conflict start? We kind of had to go far back, as as far back as we can. Um, the class period is supposed to start roughly around 1200, so this is puts, puts us at a good time period. Um, in the history of England, you have King Edward I, who is also nicknamed Edward the Longshanks. He earns a reputation for being very, very cruel, especially to the Scottish people. He was actually given the nickname Hammer of the Scots. Longshanks is a, um, I guess you can say, a, a nickname for the fact that he had really long legs. Um, Edward was like it says, very, very cruel. Um, he loved to remind the Scottish people that he was in charge of them, that he was dominant, that England was uh, the controlling power. Edward I did have a son, Edward II, who was king of England from 1307 until 1327. So there's a picture of Edward I and a picture of Edward II. Uh, pretty hard to deny that that's his dad. The thing with Edward II is that most historians believe that he probably did not want to be king. He was much more of a gentle-natured person. He did not really concern himself with matters of state. He would much have probably rather have been a poet or a musician or something else having to do with the arts. And so politics, warfare, all that stuff was not his cup of tea. <clears throat> when he was young, he um, was married off 
to uh, a princess, Isabella. She was the daughter of King Philip IV of France. Uh, this was done because, as we talked about in class, uh, England and France have basically been at war almost since the beginning of the creation of those two countries. And so to pacify both sides, um, they figured out an alliance would probably be the strongest uh, way to alleviate the tensions and, and alliances were always created by marriages. So you have the union of Edward II and Isabella um, of France. However, um, Isabella did want to be queen. She was very, very powerful. She earns a nickname as the She-Wolf of France. Um, she was fascinated with power. Uh, she was the daughter of a king and she knew how to kind of hold and maintain that status. Uh, and so the fact that she's married to kind of a weak king um, puts her in a very, very troubling position. Um, on top of that, Edward was known to also have favorites within the court. Um, these favorites were other nobles, other males, and he um, caused some problems with the other, the other nobles that weren't his favorites. So Isabella decides to take a lover and ally herself with this guy named Roger Mortimer. Together, her and Roger Mortimer basically overthrow um, Edward II with a small army in 1326. Edward was captured and he was forced to give up his throne to his young son Edward III. So one smart thing that Isabella did was that immediately upon marrying Edward II she gives him an heir which also adds to her legitimacy as a queen because she is the queen mother, she is um, the mother to the future king of England. The thing is is that Edward III is still kind of a child and so it puts her also in a high position of power to be kind of like his regent. So she has to pretty much be in charge until he's old enough to be king. So I put some pictures of them all there together. Um, Edward I, Edward II, Edward III. Strong genes. Um, then you have a picture of Isabella there at the bottom. She was considered very, very beautiful. Um, then you see a picture of her on the battlefield with Roger Mortimer. Uh, and then you see another picture of uh, one of Edward II's favorites. So when people were getting fed up with the fact that Edward II had so many favorites, so many um, gentlemen at court that he would give you know land or titles to or money to, uh, they sent him a pretty strong message. And one of them was by having this man uh, hung, drawn, and quartered. And then also brutally his intestines were uh, taken out and thrown into a fire amongst other things. So you can obviously see that the attitude towards Edward II in England wasn't that great. Edward III, however, is known for basically restoring England to its great position of power. He is noted for being um, very successful in terms of military uh, victories and battles. Um, he restores royal authority after the very unorthodox reign of his father. Um, he also makes England, like I said, a formidable milita military power in Europe. He uh, created and extended developments in legislation, which has to do with laws and government. Uh, uh, with the creation of uh, the evolution of what would be Parliament. However, during the time that Edward III is in charge, you do see uh, Europe being hit with the Black Death. And so um, he is not really unpopular, but people don't really understand um, the ideas of the Black Death or the plague, uh, especially the extreme loss of life that is occurring during that time. And so um, his era or his time period as king is marked by some darkness um, and some sickness. Even though he was crowned at age 14, uh, he could not rule officially, so his mother uh, ruled alongside with her regent uh, or her lover, uh, Roger Mortimer, which I talked about. Together they were the ones that overthrew the previous king. Uh, this does not sit well with young Edward, as you can obviously tell, because he has just watched his mother overthrow his father, who was probably imprisoned and either starved to death or, um, well, nobody ever sees or hears from him again. and so. Um, he, he essentially was murdered uh, probably by his mother and her boyfriend and so he doesn't obviously have very kind feelings about the situation or this attitude and so he um, grows up and at about 17 years old as soon as he's considered a man uh, in the eyes of the country he leads a coup he overthrows his mother and he overthrows Roger Mortimer because now he has legitimate claim he is old enough to be king he doesn't need his mom to tell him what to do anymore and he reacts pretty strongly and pretty negatively he has her imprisoned and locked up basically for the rest of her life 
um, uh, in a tower and she's supposed to be fed uh, by someone who doesn't speak to her. So he <laughs> really wanted to send a message to mommy. Um, the other thing uh, was that Roger Mortimer is also executed. So he executes um, the man responsible probably for his father's death. He becomes the rightful king, declares himself also king of France. And this has to do with the fact that his mother was a princess of France. So during the time that Isabella was in France, uh, her father uh, did have some male children, but they did not survive into adulthood. And so uh, when Philip IV dies, there's no legitimate male heir that's close to the throne. And so Edward, being a son of a former princess of France, feels like it is his uh, claim that he should also be king of France. His grandfather was king of France. And so now that his grandfather has passed, he is the closest male relative in line. And so this is actually going to spark the Hundred Years War in England because uh, for the next hundred years or so, give or take, um, the kings of England are going to claim succession over the kingdom of France as well. Then we get to some less notable kings. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly. You have Richard II and Henry IV. So Richard II was king from 1367 to 1399. He was the son of Edward the Black Prince of Wales, grandson of Edward III. So he actually um, outlived his dad or he um, survived his father. And so he becomes king, not his father. His reign is marked by a lot of rebellion, a lot of unrest. He married another princess of France, Isabella of Valois, in order to make peace. That was extremely short-lived. The very awkward picture that you can see there is a picture of Richard, um, who was probably in his mid to late 20s or even 30s with a six-year-old Isabella of Valois. Yes, creepy picture. Their marriage was a completely political marriage. Um, as soon as the marriage took place, uh, Isabella um, immediately went back with her uh, caregivers and takers. It was just on paper. Um, nothing uh, weird or anything like that happened. And, and it was very, very dissolved, or it was dissolved very, very quickly because um, he died. Uh, he was deposed and he ended up uh, probably dying of starvation in captivity. Then you get to Henry IV. Uh, Henry IV is kind of a cool situation in a way because he's going to mark the shift in what we would have from the line of kings that would be from all the way from Edward I until now, and you're going to have the beginning of what's known as the Lancastrian line. And the reason for that is because his mother Blanche was the heiress to a large number of estates known as the Lancaster estates, uh, very wealthy estates. He's a grandson of Edward III, so he's actually going to depose his cousin. He's the one that overthrows his cousin, um, Richard II, to become King of England. He um, gets into some trouble as a young man. He's disinherited by his father, but some people think that his father was um, not all there or a few fries short of a happy meal. But uh, for some reason, he was disinherited by his dad. He eventually leads a rebellion to claim his title. Henry is uh, smart because what he does is that he's technically the Duke of Brolingbroke, so that's his title. Um, Henry goes back to England and says, look, I, I don't really want to be king. Like, I know you guys want me to be king. I know my cousin Richard's also kind of a weirdo and stuff like that. And uh, I know you guys want me to be king, but I don't want to be king. I, I don't want that title. Um, I'm just going to be duke. You know, I have a castle. I have my lands. Like, let me just kind of ride into the city and, and I'll just be duke and I'll be happy with that. He does that and then the people make him king um, because he has an army and he's more popular and he's very well liked. Plus, he also has money. And so he's a lot more stable than Richard. And so he becomes king or the first Lancastrian king in the line of kings in England. So there's his picture there. Remember, um, he does have a red rose to signal the Lancastrian line. Then we get to Henry V and Henry VI. So Henry V was king from 1413 until 1422. Uh, he is also known for his outstanding military success in the Hundred Years' War. Um, Shakespeare wrote a play about him. There's even a movie about him. Uh, I think that was played by Timothy Chalamet, I want to say, but I could be mistaken and I probably said his name wrong. But <clears throat> uh, he was made famous um, for his victory in the Battle of Angincourt, uh, immortalized, like I said, in Shakespeare's plays. He married Catherine of Valois, another famous French princess. You guys can see the trend here, English king, French princess. Um, their marriage was uh, solidified by the Treaty of Troyes, which was signed in 1420. However, they were only married for two short years. And in that time, Catherine was able to give him a son. Uh, however, he dies unexpectedly, um, like from uh, complications. He, he doesn't, he isn't murdered or anything like, un, anything weird like that. He just dies. Um, 
at a pretty young age. Uh, so Catherine does give him a son. Um, uh, that son is Henry VI. Again, you guys can see the trend here with the names. They're going to carry on over and over and over again, so bear with me. He's King of England from 1422 until 1461, and you notice that there is a break. Uh, and then he's king again from 1470 until 1471. So why is there a chunk in time period that's missing, and why is he king twice? Well, at one point he was overthrown, and so we'll get into that story in a minute. Um, Henry VI is probably also very similar to Edward II um, in terms of the fact that he did not want to be king. He would have much rather, probably had wanted to be um, a monk or a priest or lived a kind of religious life, a secluded life, uh, a life um, as a scholar. He, again, didn't want to be concerned with politics. His period of reign is marked by um, division of nobility, so the nobles didn't like him. Some setbacks with France as well and periods of what we can think or identify possibly as mental illness uh, and instability. Um, Henry would have very long periods where he wouldn't speak. He would seclude himself. He would isolate himself. He didn't want to be concerned with anything regarding the government at all, and he would leave all matters up to his wife, Margaret of Anjou, another princess of France. Uh, Margaret of Anjou was very similar to Isabella, um, the she-wolf of France, because Margaret of Anjou was extremely, extremely ambitious and strong-willed. She's sometimes known as the Red Queen. Uh, she ruled for Henry in his bouts of madness, and this did not suit well with the English nobles, which is why, again, division of nobility is big during this time. Um, not, only, not only is Margaret of Anjou a woman uh, acting as king, but she's also a French woman trying to tell these English nobles what to do. So, yeah, no, that's not going to fly with them. Eventually, they're going to uh, back one of uh, Henry's relatives or closest relatives um, in support of him becoming king because rather he become king than have a woman, a French woman, be in charge of them. So some pictures. Um, you have Henry V at the top left corner. Then you have Henry uh, VI. Uh, underneath Henry V you have his wife, uh, Catherine. And then you have a picture of Margaret of Anjou. These women, again, very beautiful women. Um, that beautiful little cherubby face kid right there. Uh, he's Edward of Westminster. He is the uh, son of Henry VI and Margaret of Anjou. And the reason that I put his picture there is because I told you guys the story in class. Um, Edward of Westminster is credited with basically ordering the beheading of Richard the Duke of York. So I mentioned that they're going to get one of Henry's relatives to try and overthrow him. Uh, his name was Richard, Duke of York. Duke is reserved for the titles closest to the king. So he is uh, one of the closest relatives to the king. This is where you get the, again, battle between Lancasters and Yorks. It's a last name, but they're within the same family. They're just different branches of the same family. Um, Richard, the Duke of York, leads a rebellion against Margaret of Anjou and Henry. Uh, and at one point he is captured. And when Margaret uh, asks young Edward, what should I do with him? She, he um, basically says, cut off his head. So this beautiful little cherubby face six-year-old child orders the death, um, basically of kind of like his uncle, I guess you can say, um, and also um, Richard of York's oldest son. So who becomes king then? Because all this craziness is happening and all this disarray is happening. We don't know what's going on. So Richard of York did have another son. He actually had three more sons. But um, since the oldest one died, the next oldest one, uh, he becomes next in line of succession, and he's Edward IV. Edward IV was king from 1461 to 1470, and then again from 1471 until 1483. He marries Elizabeth Woodville. This was also really, really shocking for the English people because Elizabeth Woodville was not only um, a commoner-ish, if you will, she had a very, very low title, if that, uh, Lady Elizabeth Woodville, but also she was um, a widow. Uh, she had already been married, and her husband actually died fighting against the Yorks. So she was actually like kind of the enemy, if you will, and she already had two sons. Um, ideally, they would have wanted someone who would have been a more suitable match for Edward, somebody who would have been considered his equal, but also somebody that would have been um, a way to solidify his new uh, legitimacy as king. So obviously they probably would have wanted him to see or marry to a, a princess of some kind from another country, whether it was France or from Spain or somewhere else. And his uncle, um, Richard Neville, also nicknamed the Kingmaker, um, gets really, really angry with uh, Edward 
at this. And Edward the Fourth kind of basically tells him, look, she's my queen of choice. You know, deal with it, get behind me, or get out of my way. And that's going to pave the way for further complications and further issues between them, because Part of the reason why Richard Neville earned the nickname the Kingmaker is because he made Edward King. Um, he backed him, he backed the Yorks, he backed his father, he had led this rebellion, they were successful, he gets an army in his name and he does all of these things. And um, now Richard Neville feels essentially betrayed by Edward because he has gone a different route without asking him, consulting him, or doing anything like that. Edward IV also executes his brother, George, the Duke of Clarence, uh, for treason. So um, George was the uh, middle brother, um, and being the middle child can be somewhat difficult, uh, especially because you're stuck in a place where you have to be um, kind of dependent on your older brother to give you certain titles and certain allowances. And he figured that if his older brother was out of the way, then he was going to be king. Uh, the problem with that is people really didn't like George. And so at one point, Edward is even captured by George and Richard Neville because they betray him. But then um, that is quickly done away with because none of the nobles support Richard or George. And they basically force him to reinstate Edward as king. And instead of being a jerk about it, Edward actually says, you know, I forgive both of you. Like, just let's put it behind us, this water under the bridge, blah, 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 so on and so forth. However, <clears throat> George continues to deep uh, or dig himself deeper and deeper and deeper into this big giant hole because at one point he also allies himself with Margaret of Anjou, the former Red Queen, the Queen of Henry VI. Um, he's still alive. They've, they've escaped to some territory probably near France for their safety, but they are still very much alive and he kind of uh, makes an agreement with Margaret about putting her back on the throne and then he would inherit some titles and there's a lot of backstabbing going on as you're going to see with a lot of these families. Um, but George... Um, is married uh, uh, to Richard Neville's daughter, Isabel, uh, and they have a child, uh, and then they have another child, but that child uh, passes away, and so George slips deeper, deeper, deeper into madness, and there is this rumor around court um, that Elizabeth Woodville is a witch. The reason probably is that People used witchcraft to justify a lot of things back then, and the idea that this lowly woman, this widow, this you know poor peasant girl was able to trap a king, um, she had to have used witchcraft to kind of ensnare him or something like that. Um, and there was some you know mystery surrounding her and her family, but uh, was she probably a witch? No. Um, did she cause the death of George's uh, child with Isabel? Probably not, but he blamed her and he would go about court telling anybody who would listen stories about her being evil and this and that and um, speaking badly about the Queen of England is a big no-no uh, and he also continues to say bad things about his brother as well so eventually they have no choice but to execute George for treason and then I told you the cool story or not cool but uh, kind of dark story about this um, George uh, gets to choose how he wants to die and he uh, wants to be drowned in Malmsey wine uh, that was an, an homage to Elizabeth because her favorite wine was Momsy wine. And so he kind of wanted to taint that for her forever because he was drowned in it. So essentially, even as he's dying, he's trying to send a message to everybody like, you know, it's, she's responsible for this. Later, Edward um, gets older in his life um, and he gets out of shape. So I, I, I should go back a little bit, just a little bit. He was um, probably the oldest, I'm sorry, not the oldest, the tallest monarch um, classified. He, they estimate that he was probably around 6'4". Uh, very athletic, very handsome, very fit, but when he becomes king uh, and then all these wars and all these battles and everything is over, he kind of gets pretty sedentary in his lifestyle and he doesn't um, exercise or work out as much and uh, he dies later of complications from health. Um, Edward and Elizabeth had many, many, many children. So she already had two children uh, with her previous husband that had passed away um, in battle. With Edward, um, she has a lot of daughters uh, and at least two sons, uh, also named, <laughs> ironically enough, Edward and Richard. So she has two legitimate sons to pass on the lineage to uh, should anything happen to Edward IV. So when Edward IV is going to uh, pass away, he basically asks his youngest brother, Richard, they all have the same names, I'm sorry guys, but yes they do. He asks his younger brother, Richard, to be kind of like Lord Protector. So until my youngest son, or um, until my son Edward V, 
is old enough um, to be king by himself? Will you be Lord Protector? Will you be his guardian? Will you take care of him? And Richard obviously says, yes, bro, I got your back. You know, don't worry. You can die in peace. Um, that doesn't happen. Edward V was never officially crowned king. He was taken by his uncle to the Tower of London, along with the younger brother, Richard, the Duke of York, and they were never seen or heard from again. These boys are sometimes given the nickname the princes in the tower. Um, basically, he had taken Edward V for his protection, uh, and then the boys were never seen or heard from again. Uh, as soon as these boys, I, I, I want to say it was like 72 days or something like that, then he crowns himself king. Immediately after crowning himself king, he becomes Richard III. Um, he's king from 1483 until 1485. As you can obviously tell, not a really long time because people knew what was up and they didn't like him. He wasn't very well liked. It's also going to pave the way for another person to kind of come in and take over. As soon as he is king, he passes a law known as the Titulus Regius, which basically declared that the marriage between Elizabeth and Edward was false, it was illegitimate, it wasn't actually a real marriage, therefore making all of the children of Edward and Elizabeth illegitimate, therefore they can never be king or queen of England um, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the church. And so that's why he's able to crown himself uh, king. Like I said, not very well liked. He is eventually defeated by a long distant cousin, um, Henry Tudor, at the Battle of Bosworth. The picture's here. Let me move myself. I know that sounds weird. Let me move myself. Um, <clears throat> Richard uh, is sometimes made fun of in art. Uh, this picture was actually done by, I want to say Holbein. I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure it was Holbein. Um, you notice how one of his shoulders is up as opposed to the other. Some people had originally thought this was done to make him look more of um, monster-ish, um, and some people have compared him to Lord Farquaad from Shrek. Um, Richard uh, wasn't very well liked, like I said. He did have a wife, which was the other daughter of Richard Neville, um, and they had one son, but he dies very, very young. And so people also think that he was trying to marry his niece, um, Elizabeth uh, of York, the daughter of Henry IV to make himself or give himself even more legitimacy to the throne. But again, a lot of that's in question and it's depending on which sources you read and whatnot. But going back to my point, as you know, I get sidetracked. Um, when Edward uh, dies, he dies in battle, um, uh, fighting against Henry Tudor. He is the last of the Plantagenet kings. He's the last of this line. So the Yorks and the Lancasters um, essentially die out. And it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated because I'm going to go on to the next slide to explain how they don't. But Richard is the last of the surviving Plantagenet warrior kings. He's the last king to kind of essentially die in battle. And because he was very not well liked or disliked, I should say, um, they basically leave him where he falls. He doesn't even get a proper burial. He isn't buried as a king or anything like that. And this woman who was fascinated by um, the Tudor history and the history surrounding the family of the Yorks and the Lancasters actually goes on this uh, mission to figure out where Richard was buried uh, and they eventually discover his remains. And so going back to the shoulder thing, uh, it was probably because he had scoliosis. Those are Richard's remains that were found, ironically enough, in a parking lot um, in England uh, where they think this battle would have occurred. Um, he has the curved spine, so he probably suffered um, some kind of spinal deformity or scoliosis. Um, and when they did the digging, uh, according to the documentary, they actually found him buried under the, under the letter R. Like that's where they went and they dug up in this parking lot and under the R he was there. Kind of cool. So, um, let me move myself. Okay, now I'm going back again. Whoops. Why the red and the white rose? So, Henry um, the seventh is an ancestor of Catherine of Valois. So, um, she was married at one point to Henry the fifth. And so, it is through this line that he also claims legitimacy uh, to the English throne. He's got a really weak claim. He's got a claim, but it's really, really weak. His mar uh, his mother, excuse me, Margaret Beaufort, also has a claim to the throne. So she has uh, supposedly had visions her whole life of her son being king of England. But really, for this guy to have been king, it would have been like seven or eight people would have had to have died. And like all these people did die. So it was a extreme... Um, uh, do you call it like coincidence that this man was able to make it as far as he did um, to the English throne. And so he's got 
the red Lancastrian rose because of his mother's family and his descendancy and his lineage and where that comes from. This other woman on the other side is the eldest daughter of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, also named Elizabeth. Uh, she is Elizabeth of York. And so you finally have a joining of the York and Lancastrian family. So she has the white rose, he has the red rose, and so you have the creation of this new dynasty known as the Tudors. And that is because of um, Henry's father. Henry's father, um, his last name was Tudor. He was actually, I want to say, uh, Welsh. I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure he was Welsh or from Wales. Um, and he um, created the Tudor rose, which is a combination of the red Lancastrian rose on the outside and the York white rose in the middle. By marrying the former king's daughter, he also legitimizes his claim as king of England. So it gives him a much stronger tie to the throne, um, which is going to cement his next dynasty. So he's the first Tudor monarch. He's the last king to win on the battlefield um, on my birthday, August 22nd. He marries, like I said, Elizabeth of York. They have four children, Arthur, Henry, Margaret, and Mary. Um, Arthur is the oldest child. There's some... Uh, superstition also about his name. Uh, Henry was very, very big into the mythology, and he wanted to kind of also solidify himself with some legendary kings, and so who better than to name your first child after after the most famous king uh, of Britain, uh, King Arthur, so they name him Arthur. He also supposedly claimed uh, lineage or descendancy from the Pendragon name, which was um, Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon. Again, all of that's according to stories and stuff like that. But he names his oldest son Arthur, who becomes Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales basically is the um, title that's given to the person that's next in line to be king. However, Arthur was pretty much always a sickly child, and he died very shortly after his marriage to a princess of Spain. So we do see a new trend here. Uh, England is no longer marrying their their sons to daughters of Spain. They're now, I'm sorry, daughters of France. They're looking to Spain. <clears throat> and that's because Spain is emerging as a superpower. Um, in about 1492, um, Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon married and joined their two kingdoms and basically created the kingdom of Spain as a whole. They have driven out the Muslims. Um, they have um, taken over all the other smaller kingdoms and made one unified empire. They have sent Columbus to go on his expedition to the New World uh, and the Age of Discovery. So there's a lots of um, money coming into the empire and Spain is known for its wealth at the time. They're also a very, very strict and hardcore religious uh, Catholic kingdom, which England is also at the time, and that's going to become important when we get to the Reformation in a minute. Um, they married uh, Arthur and Catherine together because they thought it would be a good union between the two of them, but also, um, even though Henry is king, England is kind of poor at the moment. And so when Catherine comes with... Uh, or comes to marry Arthur, she comes with also probably three or four ships of gold and jewels and other valuables. Um, that's her dowry. That's her wedding present uh, to her new family. So when the son dies, Arthur, um, <clears throat> Henry does not want to send that gold back and he doesn't want to send Catherine back. And so he has another son, Henry, uh, that he figures, why not let's just get them married together. Uh, I'll get into that story in a minute. So <clears throat> Henry VII uh, was pretty much known for his administrative, economic, and diplomatic uh, initiatives uh, and peace before the war. He paid very close attention to detail. He did not want to spend money lavishly. He was pretty um, paranoid about keeping control of his kingdom. He's a very new monarch. It's a new family. It's a new dynasty. And he wanted to make sure that he held on to it uh, for his family's um, legacy to continue. And so going to the idea that his first son dies of natural causes, his second son will succeed him and become king of England. So, Henry VIII. <clears throat> um, he's the one responsible, basically, for initiating the Protestant Reformation. Now, that's going to be a huge leap, because some people are going to disagree with me and be like, no, it was Luther or it was Calvin. There are, there are other people who are before Henry that were advocating for a separation of the church, of the Catholic Church, from England. There's lots of people who advocated for that. But the fact that Henry VIII is king of England and literally separates from the Catholic Church and creates a completely new church of England, the Anglican Church, is <clears throat> probably the most um, arguable point if you were writing about the Protestant Reformation. You could definitely write about uh, John Calvin, you could definitely write about Martin Luther, or even John Hughes, uh, other people who we're going to talk about a little bit later in the slides. But 
in terms of monumental significance, it's probably the story of Henry VIII. So he wants to separate himself from the Catholic Church because the Pope will not give him a divorce. So I feel like I have to backtrack a little bit again. He married his brother's wife. Arthur and Catherine were married for a very, very, very short period of time. Uh, there's some stories uh, and some uh, claims that they were married by proxy. They weren't even physically in the same place or same location when they got married. And there is a question as to whether or not their marriage was even a legal one at that because he was so ill when they got married that they were pretty much separated um, the whole entire time. They were never together as husband and wife, and so therefore their marriage could not be a legitimate marriage. So when Henry the Seventh wants to marry his second son to Catherine, uh, the Princess of Spain, he actually asks for papal dispensation. He asks for the Pope's permission for this to occur, and the Pope grants permission for this to happen. Popes at the time are infallible. When they say something, that is it. That is the end-all, be-all. They are the voice of God on earth in terms of the Catholic Church. And so if you are trying to say that the first marriage between Arthur and Catherine did not occur and the Pope is saying this, the Pope grants this annulment, um, that's, 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 uh, that's the end of that. The, their marriage was not valid. So he, Henry VIII, is able to marry Catherine of Aragon. Him and Catherine are married for a really long time, like 20 plus years. Um, they have one uh, adult daughter, Mary I, that survives um, all, like all the way to adulthood. She'll eventually be Queen of England. Um, but Catherine suffers a lot of miscarriages um, and some children that die after a very, very short time of being alive. And so Henry probably sees this as a sign that God is cursing his marriage. And that's at least what he tells people, um, is that he married his brother's wife, therefore God has cursed them. Um, <clears throat> there are different scriptures in the Bible, uh, one of them in Leviticus that says, if you marry your brother's wife, you will die childless. Well, when he tried to tell this to the Pope, the Pope says, you're not childless, you have a daughter. Uh, he didn't want a daughter, he wanted a son. He wanted a son to carry on his dynasty, his legacy. Uh, England has seen very, very few queens at this point. Um, I think I want to say only two. And both times that there was a female in charge of England, um, it was complete and utter civil war and chaos. And so Henry does not want to leave that lasting legacy for the people of England. He feels like it would be a shame on him, and he feel like he would fail or would have failed his father and his lineage. And so he starts this huge, huge, huge ordeal to get a divorce from Catherine. Uh, the Pope is not having it. He uses one of his head cardinals, Cardinal Wolseley, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is pretty much the highest position in England, to um, get a divorce from Catherine um, that is not successful. And it's also during this time that he is approached by Anne Boleyn. Uh, Anne Boleyn was new to court. She uh, had uh, previously spent a lot of time in France. She was younger. Um, her family basically put her in front of the king um, as a temptation for him. Uh, she was very smart. Uh, she um, was also very educated and she gave Henry books probably on uh, Machiavelli's ideas of the prince where basically like the prince has absolute control um, and he shouldn't have to answer to anyone and that included the popes. Uh, so why should he need the pope's power, to, uh, pope's permission to get divorced? He's the king of England. He could, He should be able to do whatever he wants to do. And so it's this continued ideas and beliefs that are sitting with Henry that kind of weigh on his conscience. Um, Henry has earned the title Defender of the Faith. He was a hardcore Catholic. He strongly believed in the faith of the church. But when he's not getting what he wants, over time, he eventually kind of gets fed up with it. Um, he doesn't know how to deal with being told no because he essentially is the king of England. So how do you have somebody that continuously tells you no? Um, Wolseley is eventually executed because he doesn't do his job. Uh, other people are also executed. Sir Thomas More because he refuses to take an oath pledging allegiance to Anne Boleyn and Henry. And ba a lot of bad things start happening, basically. Uh, at one point, when Wolseley is finally uh, taken over or his position is lost, he... Um, uh, Henry appoints Thomas Cranmer, the Archduke of Canterbury, so he replaces him. 
Uh, and the uh, Thomas Cramer basically finds the text in the Bible that basically says, you know, you're right and you're totally right in all your claims and we should annul this marriage immediately and you should marry Anne Boleyn. That is more than likely or most likely because Thomas Cranmer himself um, was also a Protestant. He did not uh, believe in the teachings of the Catholic Church. He was already leaning more towards a Reformation and there was other people within Henry's camp that were also leaning towards a Reformation. And so it was all this convincing and kind of conniving that would eventually get Henry to marry Anne in secret. Um, he basically tells the Pope, I don't care what you say anymore, I'm doing what I want, I'm King of England, come and make me, come and stop me. Uh, the Pope excommunicates Henry, which is basically a way of saying you're kicked out of heaven, you're banned from the church and all these things. Henry says, I'll make my own church. And so he makes himself head of the Anglican church, uh, which is the, the Protestant church um, in England. Eventually, he'll um, also create or pass what's called the Act of Succession in 1533, in which Catherine and his daughter Mary is declared illegitimate. His marriage to Anne is now official, and therefore his children with Anne will be the ones to inherit the throne. So you can see a, a picture of young Henry uh, and Catherine. She was older than him, but um, there are lots of letters between the two of them in which the relationship seems like it was an amicable one, or at least one based on loyalty and commitment and, and and love at some point because they were married for such a very, very long time. It's just that as he's getting older and as Catherine can no longer bear him any more children, it's very clear that she's not going to give him any sons. He's running out of options. And then you have this young girl who is presenting herself saying, I will give you a son. I can, I can do all of these things. You can be the head person in charge. It can be very enticing uh, for anyone. And so he kind of gives in to those... Um, uh, I, I don't know what you would call them, temptations, if you will. So in the picture, also you guys can see is a, a description or a, a depiction, excuse me, of uh, Cardinal Wolseley sitting at the head of this uh, meeting. And you also see Cardinal Campeggio, who was another bishop, uh, cardinal that was sent to um, overhear the um, court dealings of this situation. And you can actually see Catherine on her knees begging Henry uh, to listen to reason, listen to me. Uh, hear me out. I love you. You are my only husband. You know, we have had many children. I've given you many children. It's just that God, you know, saw fit to take them from us. And it's really devastating. And we have records of what she said because um, it was a court uh, session. And so there would have been somebody there recording these things or documenting them, writing them down like a scribe. And then the other awkward thing in this painting um, is you can actually see Anne Boleyn there in the corner. She's got a little purse or a, a thing that's hanging around her arm that has the initials H and A already put on there. So essentially you have the wife begging her husband, don't divorce me. And then you have the mistress who is standing right there watching as all of this is happening unfold before her. So it's a really, really devastating um, moment, I guess you can say. But Henry does divorce Catherine and he marries Anne. Okay, so moving myself a little bit over here. Again, I know it's a lot, guys. Sorry. I'm probably going to stop today with the Reformation and we'll cover absolutism uh, next time just because I feel like it's going to be a really long video and a lot of information for you to process. So, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Henry VIII uh, eventually also declares another act of supremacy. He declares himself head of the church, like I mentioned. He has trouble with Anne really early on. Um, almost immediately after getting married, she gives birth to a child and she gives birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. Um, the thing with that is he tells Anne, basically, if you can have a healthy daughter, you can have a healthy son. She does get pregnant again and she has a miscarriage. And then they think she gets pregnant again and she has another miscarriage. So you can see the same kind of pattern repeating itself. And rather than have him spend another 20 years with the same wife, he's head of the church now. He can do pretty much as he pleases. Um, during this time and her failure to produce the son are some of the things that happen, but he also um, dissolves the, mon the monasteries, which is a big blow to the Catholic Church. Uh, the monasteries are extremely wealthy. Uh, they're centers of education and learning as well. And uh, people who are still tied to the Catholic tradition in England do not like the fact that Henry is doing this. Um, so Henry agrees to meet with some of these people who are upset with him for dissolving the, the monasteries. Henry says, okay, I'll listen to you guys. Uh, come, out to, come out to England. Let's hear what you have to say. On their way home, he has them executed. So we also see him kind of going back and forth on his word a little bit. After her final miscarriage, Anne is accused of witchcraft 
conspiracy along with adultery, which basically means she had inappropriate relationships with other men, and along with five other gentlemen, including her brother, are executed. Uh, the one kindness that he did afford her was that he hired a special executioner to come in from France, and this guy was famous for uh, the fact that he could take the head clean off with one blow. Um, back then, uh, beheadings could take two or three hacks, or maybe more, depending on the blade and depending on the person, and, and so he really didn't want her to suffer that much, I guess, and so this guy was known for doing it in one take. Um, but she does lose her head, and she only gave him one daughter. So, poor Anne. Then, another young bride is presented for uh, Henry VIII, uh, Jane Seymour. Jane Seymour gives, gives birth to Henry's only surviving son, uh, Edward VI. However, she dies three days after giving birth, uh, probably from childbed fever or some kind of infection from um, the, per the process. He passes another act of succession, which basically says, okay, my other children, my daughter Mary and my daughter Elizabeth are out of the way, and my son is now next in line should anything happen to me. Because his wife died, again, uh, he's presented with other suitors or other uh, women uh, who uh, are candidates for marriage. Um, one of them is Anne of Cleves. Uh, there's a story behind this where a painting is done of Anne, um, and it's kind of like an ancient version of catfishing because he sees a picture of her, thinks she's really beautiful, has her scent, and then immediately when she arrives in England, he realizes the picture is not what she actually looks like in person and he has the marriage annulled. Uh, he's like, nope, sorry. Um, then he decides to marry 17-year-old uh, Catherine Howard, which happens to be a first cousin of Anne Boleyn, except that Anne has sadly passed away or been beheaded. Um, this 17-year-old Catherine Howard um, was a lot younger in the relationship because Henry would have already been clear into his 50s or older at this point. She uh, did carry on um, extramarital affairs with two other gentlemen and when it was discovered, all three of them were executed. Uh, according to the story, you can actually uh, hear the ghost of Catherine Howard in Whitehall Palace, I think. Um, very, very lastly, uh, his sixth wife, Catherine Parr, um, outlived him. So Henry <laughs> dies and she outlives him. He, She was able to convince Henry to reconcile his relationship with his two daughters and put them back in line for succession after Edward VI. So some pictures, um, you can see Henry uh, and young Edward as a young man and then creepily enough you can actually see Elizabeth, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, there's so many Elizabeths and Edwards and they all have the same name, uh, Jane. You can see Jane Seymour in the painting but you're like, wait a minute, didn't she die three days after giving birth? She did, um, but he loved her so much according to the stories, that he wanted her represented in art as well. She's the only queen that's actually buried with him um, in St. George's Chapel. Then you have pictures um, in the top, Anne of Cleves, that's the one that's according to the story, the catfish version, Catherine Howard over here on the bottom, and then his very last wife, Catherine uh, Parr. They all have the same names, and Catherine, uh, except for Jane, she was the only one that was different. And then the palace in the bottom that my face is blocking, I apologize, um, is Whitehall Palace, but at one point it did burn down, so it's not there anymore. I'm almost done, <laughs> I think. Edward VI, so Edward VI is only king also for a very short period of time. He becomes king at nine years old, but when his father dies, um, uh, but uh, being nine years old, he's not old enough to be king by himself, so he has a couple of regents that rule for him. His um, uncle, Edward Seymour, and then later uh, John Dudley, who would also be regent for him as well. During his reign, this is where you see, again, a huge shift and a move away from Catholicism. It was never officially outlawed, but during Edward's reign, Protestantism is fully established in the realm. You have other teachings from Martin Luther, you have other teachings from John Calvin, you have other teachings that are popping up in all different parts of the world, but in England is where it really, really takes root. Um, you'll see some uh, Protestantism pop up in France as well, and we'll talk about that too, probably in the next video, because this is going to be a really long video. Um, during the time of Edward VI, you see the abolition of clerical celibacy, which means priests no longer have to be celibate, they can get married and they can have families. You also see the change of Mass being said in Latin. So under the Catholic tradition, Mass is said in Latin, um, which is pretty much difficult for the average everyday person because the average everyday person doesn't speak Latin. The prayer books are also in Latin and so people can't read Latin either. And so you have to rely on a priest or a clergy member to read or describe things for you 
because you don't understand the language, you don't understand what's happening, especially if you're not an educated person. Um, that's why Catholic churches are filled with art, because how do you teach people the biblical teachings? You show them pictures. Um, however, Edward eventually falls ill. His advisors come up with a plan to try and keep Catholicism out of the country because if you remember, when Henry reestablishes the connection with his daughters, the next in line to the throne is his daughter Mary I, who is a super hardcore Catholic because her mother was a super hardcore Catholic. Her grandparents are known as the Catholic King and Queen of Spain. And so the idea that if Edward dies, this new Catholic or this Catholic Queen is going to come back and switch everything that was just done in the last, you know, six years is going to cause extreme amounts of chaos. So they, they, they take a leap and they actually name and create a will that would name his uh, cousin, Lady Jane Grey, as his successor. She's a Protestant and she is somebody that they can control. Mary I, however, very quickly raised an army, marched on England and claimed her rightful title to the throne. Uh, Jane is deposed and executed. She's sometimes known as the Nine Days Queen. Sorry, Jane. She is known for her aggressive attempt to undo the English Reformation. So in six years, while Edward was king, um, almost all of that is completely undone in the time that Mary is also queen because Mary earns the nickname Bloody Mary for the execution of over 300 people that refused to convert back to Catholicism. This is also known as the Marian persecutions. She was pretty hardcore and she was pretty serious that England was going to go back to the rightful way of doing things. Um, on top of that, she was married to King Philip of Spain, um, together since they were older uh, when they got married they didn't have any children either and so now the issue is going to become what happens uh, to the throne of England when Mary dies because she has no children to survive her. Um, we see the throne pass to um, her sister so I'll get to that right now in a minute. You can see Mary um, as an older uh, figure picture that the other picture I showed you was her young in her younger days you can see Jane uh, Lady Jane Grey being executed the 90s Queen and then Philip the second of Spain he's also going to become important in a minute because um, before Mary dies uh, Mary the first she um, was older in her age but she probably also had some kind of ovarian cancer or cervical cancer she was never able to produce children um, before she even dies, Philip proposes marriage to her sister Elizabeth because he also doesn't want to lose the connection to England. And so that's going to cause later problems. Uh, it's, uh, Philip is not very well liked either. So Elizabeth becomes Queen of England. Her first act was to immediately reestablish the Protestant Church, which her mother was a Protestant. Her mother was Anne Boleyn, the one that was executed. And she calls herself and names herself the Supreme Governor of the Church. She, however, was relatively tolerant of the practice of religion. She didn't like to be t um, asked or broached on the issue. She didn't want to see be seen as, as punishing Catholics in her kingdom. So she kind of just said, if my people follow the rules, let them practice and let them believe what they will. Um, even though she was uh, an advocate of a common prayer book and things like that, she did push Protestantism. She um, did not want to punish Catholics either. The Pope, however, has her declared illegitimate, uh, and he basically told her subjects, um, you don't have to listen to the Queen. That's a big slap in the face. This is going to lead to many plots to assassinate her, so throughout her lifetime, there are many, many plots to overthrow her and assassinate her, uh, made famous also by the military victory of the Spanish Armada. So what does that mean? Philip II, the guy that I showed you on the previous slide, uh, builds an army of ships to go and seize Elizabeth, uh, or seize England and seize power. Um, however, Elizabeth and her uh, navy uh, overthrow this Spanish Armada. It's destroyed and it leaves Spain uh, bankrupted and Philip humiliated. She would rule England for the next 44 years. It was during this time that England gets the nickname, you know, the Golden Age. She creates a national identity for her people um, and she creates stability. Another thing about England is that she earns the nickname the Virgin Queen uh, because she also chose to never get married. It's one of the reasons why uh, when you see early exploration of the Americas during this time and you have um, the founding of Virginia, Virginia is actually named after her. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh um, puts it or establishes it under her name uh, for her, I guess you can say. So one of these plots to assassinate Elizabeth was actually um, orchestrated uh, by supposedly Mary Queen of Scots. So Mary Queen of Scots was six days old when she became queen. Uh, she spent most of her childhood in France while Scotland was ruled by regents. Um, at a very young age, she marries Francis the Dauphin of France. They were only married for two years. They did not have any children, and so therefore she returns to Scotland and reclaims her throne. She then marries her first cousin, Lord Darnley. He also has a claim to the English throne, so both of them have a claim to the English throne, and both of them are Catholic, which is a super big threat to Elizabeth. They did have one son, James. This is super important. 
Elizabeth, by refusing to marry, um, doesn't have any children. Uh, and so the idea and the question is that, again, who is going to be king and queen when that person dies? Um, the, 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 the conflict is going to be because Mary wants to be named um, the heir apparent or the heir successor to Elizabeth. Uh, and the fact that she has a son to carry on her name as well that also has a claim to the English throne is a big indicator that this should be the right move in the eyes of uh, Elizabeth. But Elizabeth is being warned by her advisors that, you know, Mary, again, is a hardcore Catholic. Do you really want to throw England into another religious war where we just recovered from the last one and your sister was, you know, crazy burning people at the stake and doing all of these things and look at what we've done for the church now? And so they really don't want to have these problems. Um, Mary Queen of Scots is uh, accused of trying to overthrow Elizabeth. She is actually imprisoned in Lochleven Castle, which I show you guys there. She actually spent 18 years basically under house arrest uh, in this castle, uh, and it is until 18, I'm sorry, 1586 that the plot of uh, the Babington plot is uncovered to um, in her handwriting, according to the stories um, that she gives the official, you know, word or commission for her to be able to have Elizabeth executed. Um, and then she's supposed to be placed on the throne. She, that doesn't happen. Uh, the plot is uncovered. Elizabeth has to um, essentially try Mary for treason. And then Mary is forced, or Mary has to abdicate her position, her title, to uh, her son, James, her young son, James, which she never sees or hears again. Uh, and then she uh, loses her head also. So there's Mary. There's the alleged uh, Babington plot in uh, Mary's handwriting that talks about them having permission to go ahead and go forth with killing Elizabeth, uh, which is treason. And then the very, very last picture is uh, Mary herself being executed for treason. Okay, I'm gonna, whoops, I'm gonna stop here because it's already re reaching at about an hour. And I know that's a lot of information to process. So the reason why I wanna stop here is because one of the monarchs that we're gonna talk about in terms of absolutism is gonna be James. And so I'm gonna carry this topic over into the next video. Um, I hope you guys reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm sorry and I apologize and I do miss you guys. And hopefully this helps uh, answering the long essay questions. Bye.